<clears throat> Hello again, everybody. This is Martin Spriggs with Wells Tech, episode 408 for September 1st, 2015. A little show about technology, ministry, where those two intersect. That's what we talk about uh, for a few minutes. And thank you for joining us. And thank you, Sally Draper, for joining me as usual. How are you? I am great, Martin. Happy to see you today. Happy to be joining you for uh, a wrap up of this summer uh, season. It's September already. It's time to get back in the groove with regular Wells Tech episodes, but we're finishing up the end of summer with our um, last in our Imagine That series. Yep. And uh, just in, in true before Labor Day fashion, we're finishing things up and we'll start anew after Labor Day next week. Um, I've been enjoying this series. How about you? I have, and it seems like it's touched a lot of um, people as well because we've been getting lots of great feedback about the different lessons we've um, shared uh, about image editing and creating uh, fancier graphics and things with your images. So I think it's something that affects a lot of different areas of ministry and in our personal um, yep. outreach we efforts as well. Yeah, we've been preaching a lot off and on over the years that images are important, whether that's in social network uh, posts or a website or you know any kind of presentation is just enhanced by the use of images. And uh, so we've talked about stock photography. We've talked about taking your own photos. Uh, we've talked about some of the editing tools and then some of the you know, kind of advanced features, to, ways to present that. We're going to wrap up today with maybe one of the most important topics, uh, if you, at least you care about those images that you've collected over the years, and that's managing, organizing, archiving, uh, just, to, just the techniques that could be used to, to make sure that you can both find them and uh, that you don't lose them probably even more importantly. Sally, have you ever lost any photos? Um, I guess I could probably say I have, but I feel pretty confident with this, the methods I have set up. So um, it's more like there's just so many. Just finding the right one um, in all of history is, is a little bit challenging. So they aren't lost. They're organized, but part of it depends on my memory somewhat, and maybe that might fail me every once in a while. Right, so. they're lost, and they can be lost in more ways than one. I guess. Yeah. With the, <laughs> with the approach that we're taking, I think the uh, as we kind of walk through the different tools and techniques, there's it's it's probably safe to say there's no right or wrong way. There's the way you do it. There's the way I do it. There's all kinds of tools and approaches. Uh, some cost money, but not a lot. Some don't cost anything. Uh, some rely on uh, a, a strict organizational structure. Some rely on more diligence with uh, keywording and uh, tags and albums and collections and those kinds of things. And each service does it a little bit differently. It seems like now with the advent of mobile, it is extremely, it's even more important than before to try and make sure that you've got a place to save this stuff and can get back to it. And because um, we're taking, we're taking more pictures than ever. That's exactly what I was thinking, Martin. I'm definitely uh, taking more pictures than I did back in the days of film. Now that everything's digital, it's really easy to take 20 versions of that picture just to make sure I got the right one. I was just out the other night. We had this really beautiful red moon, and uh, I said, I've got to be able to get a good moon picture. I've seen some really fabulous ones. So I looked up, you know, settings, ISO, and all of that fancy stuff, which I'm not real up on. Set up my tripod, had my shutter speed really slow, you know, and I took, I think, about 25 pictures. And, you know, funny thing is the best one was at the end. I took it off the tripod, and I just, just randomly, you know, without much prep, took one more shot. Turned out that was the very best one. So I don't know, should I keep all those 24 that didn't end up being as good as I wanted them to be? It's hard to let go of some of them once you've taken them. So it's a mentality. Stay and you, you, as you take more and more photos, I think, and, and as you really get serious about managing them, I think it becomes a little easier to get rid of some because there's just mm -hmm. so much stuff to go through. And you know, at, over time, you, you figure, um, it's going to be easier on me and more helpful to me in the future if I if I just kind of center in on the ones that I know I'm going to use or the ones I know I'm going to want to look at 
again in the future. So sure. So Martin, when you're out and about and taking pictures, do you immediately come and take them off of your camera? Like if you're using your your nice camera, do you immediately put them on your local computer and back them up and that kind of thing right away? When I'm diligent on, about it. When I'm on vacation, I try really hard to do that because that's when I'm taking a lot of my pictures. Um, because if I don't, it's going to be a while until I get back to them. Uh, another reason to do that is I want to share, you know, share during the trip. So I'll, I'll download a few that I think are keepers and then upload them to Flickr or, or Google Photos or whatever so that I can share with, with friends and family along the way. I would say that's a really good practice, uh, kind of should be baked into your workflow as a, as a rule of thumb is get them off your camera as soon as, as soon as you can that evening if you can you know carve out some time or the next day or the next weekend uh, just figure out a way to get them off your camera and then into your system somehow because uh, the, the longer they stay there the less obviously useful they they become so and speaking of a system i'm guessing we have different systems we hadn't really revealed that to each other yet although i revealed mine a while back and uh haven't really changed much from the system that we talked about back in i think 2011 when we talked about uh image storage and mine is very um non-system i guess it, the systems in my brain as i said before and and i use a, a folder system on my local computer to organize by year and then within the year i organize by month and then within the month i organize by day and i try to put a little description with the day so i can remember the event so most of the time when i'm looking for something i can remember approximately when it happened and then i can go back and and find things that way and search through my photos that way and and I've used that for many years now and it hasn't failed me yet. Now I do oftentimes back up the very best ones to my Google Drive or, or other storage locations. Sometimes I use Dropbox. Um, sometimes I throw an album up on Facebook to share, you know, or whatever. But the home for most of mine is on my, my local server that we have in our in our family network. And and I try to do it, like you said, very diligently as I take the pictures, I try to get them off of there, not let them sit for the next three months and forget about them or whatever, but get them into my my system of organization pretty quickly. So how do you view your fo your uh, photos? Do you just use whatever's built in, you know, in the operating system? I do typically just use the, the Windows viewer that, that comes with the and, you know, sometimes you can print from there. If I want to do fancier things, I upload to different print, you know, options and things that are on the web. Mm -hmm. One so. more question, and then I'll share mine. Um, if you wanted to do some editing, you know, on a particular image, do some cropping, red eye removal, increase the exposure, you know, get rid of a color cast, that kind of stuff. What tool do you use for that? I'll give you a clue. I got a big monkey grin on my face. I'm a big PicMonkey fan. So typically I upload to PicMonkey, although I do own a personal copy of TechSmith Snagit. And oftentimes I'll do editing in Snagit. That's just the platforms that I'm comfortable with and, and they cover all my needs. So those are my two go-to yeah. editing tools. Yeah, and everything you mentioned is basically free or close to free. Mm -hmm. So very, very low cost uh, solution. Uh, yeah. Mine's a little more struck. Uh, you're say, you're, you're, you say you rec you uh, rely a lot on your memory, but really you do have a structure, you know, very, I do. a pretty rigid structure of, of year and event, those, those kinds of things. And I guess I do that too. I put things in year, but I try and use a tool that I can view them in any way that I want. And uh, so I use Lightroom. I've talked about that in the past. That's from Adobe. And I've used that for a number of years now. And uh, what Adobe has done is they've made it a lot more reasonable just for anybody to use. They have a, a Creative Suite uh, package called uh, uh, Creative Cloud for Photographers. And it's basically a bundle of Lightroom and Photoshop, which is a, a very powerful tool all for $9.99 a month. So you're, you're paying, you know, 120 bucks a year, but uh, those tools by themselves are, were, uh, in uh, the not too distant past, were, uh, were very expensive. So this has brought them down to the consumer level. And uh, I really couldn't 
uh, process or, or live without those tools at this point. So uh, I will bring them in uh, to Lightroom and uh, do any editing. Uh, Lightroom has a lot of editing tools. That's kind of why I asked how you do your editing uh, because I like to be able to edit right in the tool that I'm viewing my photos in. So I'll bring them in and uh, I'll zip through the, the photos uh, right away when I come in. There's a, a one key command to reject a photo, the X key in Lightroom. So I can use my arrow keys in X and I can zip through you know, those 25 moon pictures and get rid of the 24 and keep the, the 25th one and do the editing on that. And I just hit the delete key on the other 24 and they, they just disappear. Um, another thing that uh, Lightroom allows you to do is uh, keyword or tag them. So I can uh, uh, assign a keyword, whether it be a you know, location or a trip, similar, I think, to the way you use folder names. So I know what this was about. And I could even put you know, who was in the photo, if there's people in the photo, um, or if I have a particular use for a photo, I could keyword it with that. All kinds of uh, cool ways that I could now slice and dice my photo so I can say just show me all of the uh, all of the vacation 2015 photos and even though they would span different days and maybe even be in different fol folders across Lightroom I could I could bring them all together and do uh, actions uh, batch actions on all of them but as far as where they live so I'll bring them into the computer because that's how the import process works you put in your your SD card and uh, in it comes to the computer in a local drive. But eventually, uh, when I uh, import them, I take them to a flash drive. So I've got a 256 gig flash drive. They make them, I think, 512 now. But this wow. is a 256 gig flash drive, which is about half the size of my entire hard drive, which is awesome because I can fit every photo I've ever taken on this. Uh, which is which is really cool. Now I can't lose this, although <laughs> I do have backup strategies as well. So there's two things that I do. I'll take the contents of this flash drive and I use uh, Backblaze, which I've talked about before. So for 50 bucks a year, uh, whenever this thing is plugged into my computer, back, back, Black Backblaze um, uh, leaps into action and then saves all my photos up to the cloud. So uh, they're up they're just in kind of a backup state and I can get them back if I were to ever uh, lose this or something were to happen to this guy corrupted whatever but then I also copy uh, Lightroom allows you to sync your photos to other photo sharing services so both you and I have our photos locked up in a, in a hard drive but if you ever wanted to show them online or show them on your phone or whatever you have to get them off your hard drive or off your server into some kind of cloud storage solution. So I use Flickr for that. I've been on Flickr for a long time and I paid uh, I pay the uh, annual 29 bucks and I get basically unlimited storage. I was kind of grandfathered into that. I think now you get a terabyte, but uh, that's a lot of photos. If you ever reach that, you're taking photos all the time, big photos and keeping mm -hmm. all of them. Uh, so now I have my photos in three places. I've got my photos on my flash drive I have my photos backed up to Backblaze, and then I have them online available in Flickr if I ever wanted to pull out my phone and show my vacation pics or show pictures of family or whatever. And Flickr, I've got kind of a complicated system of what, who can see what, that kind of thing. But I can always search it, tag it, and my tags carry across because uh, Lightroom works that way nicely with uh, Flickr. Nice. Any keywords or tags you put in Lightroom will will go up to uh, will go up to Flickr. So. I've got myself covered in that fashion. So those are kind of the big hitters in, in my system. And I think everybody is going to be more comfortable in, with, with some kind of tool. But I think in general, it's good to have a tool like uh, Lightroom or you use PicMonkey, but also an organizational tool where you can add tags. <laughs> I'm assuming you can add tags uh, when you open your stuff up on your computer as well, right? Um, sure. I was actually going to mention that Snagit has a, a tagging methodology built into it as well. But one more thing I thought of, and I'm not sure if you have a solution for this or do this very regularly, but oftentimes I want to batch resize 
because um, the pictures as they come off my SD card are super large and not suitable for sharing via the web. And I use Snagit for that because Snagit has a really handy batch resize utility. And that's something that I've met a lot of people that would like to have that capability because it's really a pain to open every individual photo and resize it one by one. And oh, so yeah. being able to say, take this whole folder, make a smaller version that's maximum you know, 800 pixels wide or whatever, and store it in a different location or whatever, then that's that's pretty valuable. And then one other thing that I do consistently as I'm editing photos is I'll use um, some naming schemes. So as they come off my, my camera, they have like DSC, underbar, and some number, you know, so it's pretty generic, just a, an image numbering system that part of the, the camera software. Um, so if I end up, you know, cropping or resizing or whatever, I'll oftentimes um, put a dash and put the new image dimensions after the file name. So I'm not writing over my original file and I'm storing it with some really valuable data. I can look at that file name and know right away how many pixels you know, wide and, and high it is. And so that's really valuable to me. I also sometimes will add like a W for um, words if I do overlaid text so that I can know from the file names the ones that I did overlay text on or maybe just an S for small if I don't want to put the actual um, dimensions. If I'm resizing a batch, I'll just add an S to the file name to indicate that it's the smaller version or those kind of little um, techniques I try to be consistent with. So the more you do with your imagery, you can recognize very quickly and easily which ones are your edited versions. Yeah, and if you're real consistent, you can even search by that kind of file name with wildcard mm -hmm. matching, that kind of thing. Yeah, Lightroom yeah. does the same for me. It allows me to, uh, it actually has a lot of plugins so I could upload uh, automatically to Facebook albums, that kind of stuff, or share to social networks. So, uh, and then when, uh, one thing I like about Flickr is you can upload the full resolution of your mm -hmm. photo, but when people view it, they view a, a smaller version. And then if I so choose, I can allow them to download whatever size they want so if my mom wants to download a picture you know uh, of the family and print it she can pick the large file size download it or use the Flickr tools to to get a print made so that's that's pretty convenient so let me ask you one of the things that people are going to be challenged with going forward is if they use a point-and-shoot camera other than their iPhone or, or Android phone or whatever um, or their DSLR like we use um, You've got now a couple cameras contributing photos to the collection. How do you get your, let's say, uh, uh, iPhone photos off of the phone into your system? Well, I think we talked a little bit about this at some point in this series, but one thing I do is I use the if this and that oh, yeah. uh, recipes. And so I set up a recipe, for instance, anytime I Instagram something, which is my favorite pictures, that's where I, you know, enjoy sharing them, then they automatically save to my Flickr account. And there's a lot of those connections you can make with if this then that. You know, I know that Apple has their their cloud storage and stuff. I haven't really taken advantage of that. Didn't want to introduce another place. And like I said, oftentimes I take 22 million pictures when I'm really just looking for one and I don't want to upload all of those. So um, I, I kind of zero in on my Instagram account as being the, the touch point for some of my favorites off my phone and, so and do the backup it went that to, way. It goes to Flickr, mm -hmm. but it's not on your home server. Then. So those pictures are in two different places. So is that a well, flaw in the system or you just kind of, that's just one of those things you just live with and, and that's okay. Because Instagram I, may go away, you know, at some point, then what happens, you know, to those, those valuable photos, of course, in those memories, right? Right. And I would say, Martin, I can't imagine that you would find a flaw in my system. So I'm kind of offended, but you know, whatever. No, it's not a flaw in my system. Of course not. Occasionally I do download my, my image library so okay. that my phone doesn't fill up with images and stuff. I do regularly, you know, just get a copy of that and clear out my phone. So, okay. yeah, I have, I have that covered too, but it's, it's a little more, 
It's not like I do that every single time. Like I do with my camera, I'm a lot more disciplined. My, my phone, I just kind of get to a point where I have too many to scroll through and then I'll think it's time to clear it off and start again. So. I think the simplicity, there is something to simplicity and there are so many services out here. At some point, I had pictures on Flickr and Google Photos and Facebook and you know, obviously in Lightroom and then you throw in those things you put on Twitter and you know, Pinterest and, you know, the, the, they're everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's gotta be home base at some point where, you know, that if I, if I've taken a photo, I can at least count on it being here. So that's, that's something really, really important to remember for, for photos that are taken for a church or school or your organization, that there is some central place for that and that you begin to organize that and there's somebody responsible for it. And there's some kind of, um, consistent tool usage and tagging and organizational structure, especially if you're not the only one uh, feeding images into this collection. Hey, I had two thoughts. First of all, you just touched on something really important that, you know, we're all about technology for ministry and we have applied all of our, our past imagine that's to you know churches and schools but storage is really important and archiving is really important for congregations and schools as well so um, perhaps you need to come up with a committee or a group of people that enjoy that kind of thing and make sure that you are retaining archives um, we mentioned in a past show Martin how our generation may end up with no history because of going digital and then losing our digital identities over time and stuff. And certainly churches and schools are probably uh, just as susceptible to that. So make that a, an effort in your congregation or school to make sure someone is archiving and paying attention to this kind of stuff and perhaps printing a few of your favorites and, and storing them in some location so yep. you don't lose your history. There's kind of nice a, to look back on. Yeah, there's kind of a one dimension of my pick of the week that that I'll, I'll address that too because there's awesome. a, basically when you're talking about archiving, you know, the history of the congregation, you're talking about journaling its history, and mm -hmm. I'm talking about a journaling tool I've talked about in the past, day one that will allow you to intermix pictures and and uh, and text, which is really what you're trying to build when you're trying to archive more and more as you're trying to archive the history of a church you want or school. Uh, you want pictures and you want narrative. So Absolutely. Tell One me. more thing to mention. I'm sorry. I'll go ahead. Um, just on the concept of tagging and things, you mentioned Google Photos, and I know Google Photos and Facebook, they both have um, algorithms in place. They have logic in place that will do face scanning and, and identify people based on um, facial characteristics. And it just struck me funny um, this week, just reading a friend's um, Facebook post. He mentioned something about Google Photos and they do some instant and awesome stuff with your photos and stuff. And he was sharing one of those on Facebook and someone commented, Google Photos is a little creepy. Uploaded 30,000 pictures, not exaggerating. It picked out all eight members of our family and identified the children all the way back to infancy. Interesting, huh? And the feedback was creepy as in awesome, but I don't know, somebody <laughs> might think that's creepy and not so awesome that, that Google has that much intelligence that it can identify facial char characteristics and go back through the, the ages of your children and stuff. Yeah. And there's, there's value in that. that that's a real mm -hmm. time saver if you're looking to, to do something like that. I know when my kids graduated from uh, elementary school, we that. always built yeah. a poster with all their pictures from infancy all the way up just you know more or less to embarrass them more than anything else but <laughs> you yep, go I've back in time senior. and find all those photos so yeah absolutely so i think i'm done interrupting you now if you, no. were, you might carry on <laughs> <laughs> um i think we've talked about a lot of the organizational tools that are available google photos apple photo Flickr, lightroom Picasa is still out there. That's a Google product. Um, and then some people use Flickr or even Facebook to, to manage, you know, all their, all their photos and just recognize what you're dealing with and you want to make sure you can get them out of the system if, if at any point you need to. There's also different storage tools. You use an online server or a uh, home-based server, Sally, but there are other storage solutions that'll store your stuff in the cloud. Dropbox, everybody's heard of. Um, and fairly reasonably priced uh, 
as well. And there are other tools like it. OneDrive comes to mind. Uh, so for Dropbox, uh, the way Dropbox works is uh, you have a synced folder or, or not even synced. You can just upload them directly to Dropbox. But uh, you get two, gig, two gigabytes for free, which isn't going to go very far when you've got uh, photos mm -hmm. of any size. But you can get one terabyte, which uh, uh, I think even somebody with 30,000 photos would be challenged to, uh, to fill up for 120 bucks a year. Uh, OneDrive is a little bit cheaper. So for one terabyte of uh, OneDrive storage uh, through the Office 365 subscription that we've talked about in the past, uh, Office 365 Personal is only 70 bucks a year. Plus, uh, you get to install the whole Office suite on one computer, one tablet, and one phone. Or uh, a really good deal is if you uh, are an Office user and want that uh, OneDrive storage, um, for 100 bucks a year, uh, you can get the Office 365 Home version, which allows you to install it on five computers, five tablets, and five phones. So really good deal, and then you get that all that storage as well. So those are good uh, good services to consider if you want, uh, first of all, cloud access. Uh, and you don't have to store just photos in there either. You can store any kind of files uh, that you want maybe out of the house and backed up someplace, you know, right. someplace other than your basement or whatever. Avoiding so catastrophe. Are, huh? Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So you've got these services that are also very useful if you're if you're mobile at all too, because you can bring up different stuff on your phone or tablet, you know, when you're on the go. So those are some of the storage solutions. Sally, maybe we should talk a little bit about uh, tagging, searchability. Um, you talked a little bit about what you do, and I talked a little bit about what I do, but there are other kinds of tags that you can use um, and each system uses a different term for them uh, some call them albums collections tags keywords you use folders you mentioned face tagging um, mm -hmm. I would um, and Lightroom has that as well but uh, there's also something uh, which I'm gonna which is uh, gonna be my pick this week an app for this is geotagging so uh, the photos that you take, with your smartphone are by default geotagged. Um, obviously, you want to be careful with that. If you're publishing these photos online, uh, people can tell where you are, uh, maybe where you live, and maybe that's not what you want. Uh, so just be careful with that. But uh, anything that you uh, take with uh, anything with a GPS in it, uh, like a phone, mm -hmm. is going to be able to tag. A, pretty much your exact location. So that's another tag that uh, could be very useful, um, knowing uh, where you were when you took a photo. Um, so right. there's all kinds of organization methods wrapped around that tagging and searchability. Right. My husband took a big trip to Israel a few years ago, and he wanted to be sure and geotag his photos. But our camera didn't have that capability built in. So he built, bought an add-on device to add the geotagging so it had the GPS in it and it was really neat afterwards he mapped out his trip and you saw his pictures of um, I think he spent like 10 days in Israel and and you saw his whole path of his trip and you could go look at pictures of the Sea of Galilee by just clicking on the location and the map right. and stuff so that was really special for any kind of um, travel it's really nice to have that connected and you know you mentioned uh, your phone has the gps built in more and more cameras have that capability built in now and more and more are going to be wi-fi enabled as well where you'll be able to to do the kind of uploading of your images to facebook or whatever instagram from your digital cameras in the future so lots of innovations still being developed yep um Sally, I think we've covered everything we needed to cover. We uh, mentioned backups as well. There's a lot of online solutions for that. We'll put a few more in the show notes. Um, just a lot of considerations, and you do need a strategy. That's why we were able to spend five weeks on this topic, because mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that uh, you need to consider here. And these we were talking about just photos you take, but stock photos have the same organizational needs as well. So if you're spending a buck or two or whatever on a stock photo, you don't want to lose track of that too. So putting that in your system, tagging it, you know, some kind of organizational method is and backing up, of course, is uh, is going to be good for for those kind of photos as well. 
Absolutely. Well, I've enjoyed imagining that with our, our series, Martin, and I think I've learned a lot along the way. And hopefully, um, if nothing else, folks just maybe are a little bit more organized and and diligent about um, keeping up with their photos and, and making use of all those great photos that, that they take or that they use in different uh, settings and ministry. So good stuff. Awesome. All right. Thanks for joining us on that journey. Um, let's move on to our next segment, and that is our picks of the week. Sally, what's up time for you? Time for me to share my screen, and mine is a little bit newsy or reading topics. And the first thing I did today as I was preparing for the show was I went to the Google home screen and uh, just started to go somewhere and all of a sudden Google started telling me that they have a brand new logo. I was really surprised to learn that as of today, September 1st, Google has rolled out a new logo. It's a lot simpler look for their logo and I'll have a link in the show notes to how it's changed and how their Google uh, logo is going to be multicolored and things. So their G has got all their colors represented and you can use it in lots of different ways and is mobile friendly as well. So there's there's thought behind it and the logo just looks a lot simpler, kind of going back to kindergarten with uh, the Google logo style. Just a little bit of news for you since we didn't have a news and tech section. I um, also wanted to just uh, make brief mention of an article I read from Hootsuite today. It's titled, The Top Three Instagram Trends for Marketers. And they say um, many people are paying attention to Instagram these days. It's very much a marketer's uh, dream to be able to reach out to their audience through Instagram and people following and using some of these techniques. First up, they talk about branded hashtags where you can include um, your brand. We did this with Wells Tech Conf. We, we promoted that hashtag for our conference this summer, Martin, and um, people are just kind of getting on board using that. Uh, different clothing brands and things maybe have been creative with coming up with um, things that are just terms that, that fit with their brand as well, like Adventure Mobile or whatever, maybe uses different hashtags. So uh, good examples there in the article for different brands tagging. Uh, they also talk about using lifestyle content, um, people using your product um, in, in their photos and, and uh, being able to recognize those. Um, as being a big dream for marketers. And then finally, um, getting things to Instagram influencers. And I was thinking about that in our circles, Martin, perhaps um, we um, share things so that um, people that have connections with congregations or whatever are willing to reshare some of our content or whatever. So I think we could put some thought around some of these ideas for churches and schools to make use of, maybe um, just to kind of beef up their presence on Instagram and give them a little more coverage. I know we haven't been doing Instagram that long for Wells Tech. We really kind of started our account around um, the conference this summer, but it's been neat to connect with kind of a new group of people there and to see their images, those that are following us, we follow back and things like that, just to see and get some more connections via Instagram. So yeah, maybe um, on the heels of this, uh, imagine that series will become more inspired and, and figure out how to make better use of this uh, photo sharing site. Um, yeah, pretty very cool popular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's going to do it for my picks of the week. OK, I have picks as well. Uh, I want to start. Not with my pick, but just a quick uh, uh, display of my Lightroom application. I talked about it incessantly, I know, over the last five <laughs> weeks. But uh, my pick has all to do with geotagging and Lightroom uh, in one of the most recent releases, the current release, of course, has the ability to uh, map all of your photos on a map. And uh, one of the things you mentioned that Kevin had to do when he went to Israel was uh, take along a little device for his, his DSLR. And a lot of DSLRs, including mine, do not have uh, built-in GPS. So, But there are workarounds for that, as Kevin found out. But also, uh, as my pick would share, uh, you have the ability to use your smartphone. So what uh, I see on my map uh, view of Lightroom are only those pictures that I've taken um, 
with a smartphone that have uploaded those phone those phone images because they are geocoded. So you can kind of see here if you're following along at home the different places that I've taken photos with with my iPhone. So a lot in Milwaukee and York County and in Indiana where my daughter lives, my oldest daughter lives, and then uh, last summer's vacation I was out in. Uh, you know, Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire. So if I click on one of those images, you know, I can uh, scroll through all those images that were taken, you know, on location. So if you zoom out really far, you can see all the photos that uh, that I've taken across, you know, the country, you know, some out to west, even down here in uh, Mexico. I've got a, a photo uh, from a trip I took uh, a while back, Florida, those kinds of things. If I zoomed out to the globe, you'd see some pictures from from Hong Kong. The unfortunate part is all of the stuff that I've taken pretty much till now uh, does not include geotagging information for my for my DSLR camera, which is a majority of the photos that I take. I don't take a lot with my, my iPhone. But as I mentioned, there's a, uh, there's a solution for that. So um, one of the things that you can use, as I mentioned, is your smartphone. And there are some awesome apps for that. The one that I use is called, let me bring it up here, is called Geotag Photos. And there's a light version and there is a pro version. So Geotag Photos is a, is a smartphone app available for iPhone or Android. There's also a desktop, desktop app available for you to view this. But uh, basically what it does is it turns on your GPS on your phone. You open it up and you uh, press a record button and you give the trip a name. Let's say um, trip to uh, Mississippi. So I'm going to take pictures around uh, the Mississippi and I want to know where I was when I took a particular photo. So you open up the app, you hit the record button, and then uh, throughout the day, your phone is uh, pinging that GPS server and then recording coordinates in a GPX format. That's uh, an exportable GPS format. And then what Lightroom will do is it'll take that GPX file and find photos taken at the similar time and then plotted on a map. And this app allows you to kind of see your route and the photos that were taken on it. Or if you go into Lightroom, it'll attach that geocoded data into the keywords, keywording system or metadata system and allow you to, to view it on, a, uh, you know, on the map that I was showing you before. Uh, so it kind of adds that GPS functionality. They've made nice improvements apparently. I haven't been using this this long. I'm looking forward to using it on some trips I'm going to be taking here in the, in the foreseeable future. Um, but uh, this will allow uh, tagging of that data in a, in a very easy format. You can even take these files and import it into Google Earth and get that mm. uh, Google Earth view, uh, whether it be Street View or the terrain or the, the route that you took. Uh, just a nice view of it, especially if you're taking a vacation, you've got those vacation photos and you you wanted to uh, plot those on a map and see where you were when you took them. Kind of a neat experience. Um, so that is um, Geophotos, Geotag Photos Pro. It's $3.99 in the uh, app stores. Uh, there is a light version. The, uh, the light version forces you to actually physically hit a button on your phone when you want to map a where you are. The uh, 399 Pro version will do this automatically. And they made some improvements so that it's a very little drain on your battery, so it can run in sleep mode. You don't have to pull out your phone. It just kind of happens in the background. Um, so kind of a nice uh, little app that you can have running on your phone if you want to add that geo-coded information to your DSLR photos or your point-and-shoot, because your point-and-shoot cameras usually don't have that uh, that GPS functionality either. So that's pretty cool stuff. It and, is. And a lot more affordable than the device that Kevin bought for our camera, I might add. Right. So um, I do have an additional pick, which I have picked before, and I was talking about this a little bit earlier in the show. And that is um, do I even have it up here? Where are you? Uh, 
Yeah, I guess I can't show this for some reason. Uh, but that's day one. I can actually show the the website. Why don't I do that? Hang on just a minute here. And let's day one is a mobile app. Day one is a mobile app. I was gonna actually show my uh, my my day one, but uh, that not, you know, the uh, behave screen sharing didn't cooperate. So here's day one. I've mentioned this before. It is uh, Apple only, so iPad, iPhone, or Mac. Uh, but it kind of reinforces that concept of you know doing something with these photos, especially if you uh, uh, have a, a need to archive an event or 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 play that role where you're trying to be a historian. For your congregation mm -hmm. or school but day one is basically a journaling app so you have the ability to um, uh, put in pictures uh, it'll take the geocoded uh, information as well and throw that in there too and then uh, text so you can format the text and you, then you can export it um, to PDF so you could print your own little uh, travel log or historical little article filled with pictures based on uh, things that you've put together and, and added into this app. And again, it works on, on an iPhone or an iPad. So as you take pictures, you can quickly add them to uh, a date, uh, write a little bit of journaling information. You can geotag it, etc. Just a be beautifully designed app and uh, um, gives you the ability to uh, to kind of be that historian and uh, attach those images to to something a little bit more meaningful than just a, a folder full of images you can put them together with uh, with text and, and location and it even uh, knows the temperature of the day and the place that you were taking the photo that kind of stuff so kind of fun and uh, just another way to uh, uh, to use the the technology that you have in your smartphone or your tablet to to uh, increase the experience and uh, give you a little bit more flexibility in how you use those photos. Yeah, and taking those notes right in the moment as opposed to trying to remember it a few months later, that's probably another of those good consistent habits to develop so that you do, you know, capture a few uh, of your reflections on whatever you're, yeah. you're sharing. And you could use a blog the same way, whatever, whatever tool you use. I think the encouragement is just to find the right tool set and, and do something like this so that uh, fit, the, the photos just don't lie dormant back in, you know, some you know, hard drive someplace, but they get out in the open and uh, people can enjoy them. Very good. Good picks, Martin. Let's move on to community feedback. And time for me to share my screen. Uh, our first round of community feedback actually is around our Wells Tech photo challenge, which we uh, started along with this summer series. If you aren't familiar, we're um, challenging you on a monthly basis for the next year to submit photos for a Flickr album. And, and um, around that and around our summer series, what we covered last week were ways to use your photos to enhance them perhaps with text overlays and things. And we heard from missionary Mike Hartman who serves in Mexico and he's uh, involved in the Academio Cristo web effort and he has a Facebook page for it and things like that that have recently launched um, reaching out um, via um, the web um, with the gospel outreach message and he um, instant message me the picture you're seeing on the screen if you're watching the video it's um, from John 14 6 Jesus said I'm the way the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me and he said hey Sally Draper I made this photo using my smartphone and the Uversion app while listening to the Wells Tech podcast it took two minutes thanks for the tip and I corresponded back with him. I asked him if we were boring, Martin, and he said we weren't. So you were wrong about that. Well, there's one person's <laughs> opinion. <laughs> that was the joke last week. Anyway, he said um, he was super glad to find an easy app like this. And he loaded this image onto the Academia Cristo uh, Facebook page about an hour beforehand. And he already had 240 shares oh, of the image. My. So awesome. over a thousand likes when I looked at it later in the afternoon and 240 folks have shared the image on their own Facebook page. Just really wonderful response. And I've, um, I'm following the page. I'm seeing them do more and more of this kind of thing. And it's just really wonderful to see it um, in action as he um, 
facilitates those mission outreach efforts. I also heard from a friend of mine, um, Pam Muskie, and she created a collage, which we also um, shared on the show last week. So if you didn't get the collage lesson, uh, rewind to episode 407 and watch it, because that's a great skill to have as well. Um, our submissions for our August challenge are just so exciting. So if you haven't visited our Flickr album where we're showing all the submissions from the photo challenge, not just showing them, but sharing them as public domain images that you can use on your own website or in whatever materials, um, you just are going to be stunned by over 80 images of outdoors and stained glass that were submitted by our Wells Tech listeners this month or, or during August. And um, I really like this one. I like them all. They're really great. But this one, um, it was from John uh, Keibel. He combined stained glass and outdoors. Look so he kind of wins the prize because he did them both in one image. I thought that was super cool. That is um, cool. But also in the, um, in the library are some beautiful pictures of an eagle. And there's a story behind the eagle pictures that our friend Bob Bullen shared. He wrote to us on um, Saturday morning and he said, uh, Martin and Sally, I believe you mentioned last week that you'd like us to be challenged to go out and take new pictures. To that end, I'd like to share the following with you. I live on a lake in northern Wisconsin and I was going out fishing yesterday afternoon. This would have been last Friday. As I neared my favorite spot, I looked up and sitting in the top of the tree was the largest bald eagle I'd ever seen. Sitting on my desk, Back at home was my camera with the 70 to 300 millimeter lens attached. The moral of this story is that you can't take the perfect picture if you don't have your camera. He's gonna, he, he wrote and said he was gonna go back out and try to find the eagle, but didn't expect to find them. Actually, later we got these images of the eagle. So kudos to Bob for finding him. He said the sky wasn't quite as perfect as it had been on Friday, but he got some beautiful pictures of an amazing bird here, this beautiful bald eagle. So um, best camera is the camera you have with you, right, Martin? Right. Take it with you. Yeah, yeah. Especially during sure. this challenge, you never know. Mm -hmm. um, just because we really appreciate them, I'm going to take the time to shout out to all of those who contributed. Emil Burgess, Anona Boyd, Naomi Green, Megan Grunke, Linda Bichu, um, Bob Bullens, Mark Thiesfeld, Lee Webster, Tim Cannonberg, John Keibel, Cindy Krieger, Marshall Luckow, um, Steve Daly, Sharon Rag Ragner, Jeffrey Fairbain, and Matt Weslow. Thank you all for your contributions to um, our Wells Tech Photo Challenge. And the challenge is on for September, Martin. We're looking for pictures of school and Bible study. And so um, we welcome folks to visit our photo challenge page. It's at wellstech.wells.net slash photo challenge. You'll find all the details about um, the challenge and a form to upload your images. It has room for you to upload three images, but there's no limit, folks. You can fill it out as many times as you want and um, all to everyone's benefit as we grow this great collection of, of imagery specifically for use in, in our churches and schools. Thank you all for being part of that. Awesome. Next up, um, a couple of articles via Digo. I think most of these were shared by yours truly. One about heading back to school with new features in Google Classroom. I saw that so, too. That looked awesome. Yeah, I know a lot of teachers are using Classroom. I'm, I'm hearing about it more and more here on the campus at Martin Luther College as more and more professors are making use of the ease of, of Google Classroom as kind of a front end to interacting with students in your Google Drive, um, sharing uh, files and having them upload assignments and things like that. Uh, there's ways to reuse your posts. They've integrated the Google Calendar and uh, some other improvements to Google Classroom. So if you're a Classroom user, this is a great article for you to scan. Uh, next up, there's an article about four devices to keep students' devices charged all day. So many, many of our schools are transitioning to this um, device-centric education experience. And in order to do that well, they have to have a charge on those devices. And so they recommend some different juice packs and things like that that might be a, an add-on solution um, to your devices. Of course, there's carts out there. There's all kinds of ways to keep things charged. But if you're in a bind and, and needing a solution, this might be an article worth uh, browsing. 
And then finally, um, a 3D printer article that, that caught my eye. It's from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and they've come up with a 3D printer that prints 10 different materials at once. Um, so the 3D printers I've seen to date have a single extruder or maybe a double extruder that can print two different materials. But this big ginormous box they've um, defined it or uh, invented at Massachusetts Institute for Technology can do 10 materials at once. So imagine the different modeling and printing that can take place. And to that end, uh, I have an update on our 3D printer work. I brought along some 3D printed, a 3D printed item. It's from our printer. Uh, we, my husband built a RepRap, which is a kind of a do-it-yourself 3D printer, and he printed this Draper's um, name thing to show. And you can even tell, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, those that are watching, but the, the letters are at different heights and things. So he got a little bit creative. So he's learning the design side of 3D print files as well as uh, refining lots of tweaking of that 3D printer to get it to behave the way you want it to. There's a whole learning curve around it and, and many, many variables involved. So um, we've, we've had a lot of fun experimenting and, and exploring uh, lots of ways to use 3D prints. Pretty cool tool. So how big of a uh, print can, can his device do? His, um, his bed is seven inches by seven inches. So that's actually really large. That's one of the advantages of building it yourself. A printer with that large of a heat bed um, would be fairly expensive. And I think we're into this maybe 400 to $450. And to have that size of print bed for that price is really good. So this, this thing here is, I don't know, probably close to six inches, five or six inches. Um, maybe four or five inches. I don't know, but um, it can do pretty big, pretty big print. So nice, good stuff. Yeah, I came home yesterday and he said, I learned something. If you put masking tape on your heat bed, it'll stick better. The first layers will stick better. So, you know, every day he's reading more and learning more, you know, from different things that he's experimenting with. So definitely a learning curve to it. Having and fun. I'm glad it's him. Yeah. <laughs> and one more website to share. Um, this comes from our HomeNet uh, community. So just like we have a listserv for our Wells Tech community where people can join and email each other through the listserv, we have one set up for those who homeschool in Wells Circles. And through that um, community, and I think we talked about this last spring, there was kind of a call for teen Bible study. So getting teens together to do online Bible study. And, and they compared it to what Synod is doing with their um, interactive, Bi interactive faith series where different people are leading online Bible studies. Well, Pastor Charlie Hepp, who also happens to be a homeschooling family, set up a group called Christ Teens, kind of making a play on the, the two words with the T there, Christ Teens. And they have an online community on Google Plus and they're kicking off their fall online Bible studies on Tuesday, September 8th. And so if this is something that would be of interest to your teen, perhaps in a homeschool setting or to supplement somehow, then you might want to check out the link we have in our show notes to the Christ Teens um, info page and get connected with Pastor Hupp and, and those involved in that effort. And that's what I have for community feedback for this week. Just a reminder to everybody, the way to contribute to the show and uh, be a part of our community feedback section is to go to our show notes page, wellstech.wells.net. Uh, you can see all of the uh, links to our social networks up at the top, different ways to interact with us, um, Google+, Facebook, Twitter, Digo, Pinterest, Instagram, we already talked about. There's <laughs> this serve. Uh, you can send us an email, wellstech mm -hmm. at wells.net. And if you go to the show notes page, you can also uh, click on the send a voicemail link. And... Uh, it will enable your microphone on your computer. You can just talk to us, and we'll get uh, we'll get that voicemail. Uh, we did get a voicemail uh, earlier this week as well. So, uh, thank you all for uh, thinking about contributing. Now, go ahead and do it. It's uh, it's mm -hmm. really easy to do, and it can be about anything. It can be a question can be uh, a solution that you've come up to a problem, uh, can be uh, kind of a review of a technology that you use in your ministry. Uh, it'd be awesome for you to share. So become a part, join the conversation as we say. 
Sally, we got something big cooking up next week. What's what's on the stove? <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't tell them in case it doesn't cook up just right. <laughs> no, I'm very excited because typically, Martin, uh, it's been our tradition on Wells Tech that we adopt a book to read throughout the normal school year part of the season. So uh, next week, it's time to kick off our book discussion for the season. And we're going to do something a little bit different. Instead of reading a book, we're going to change gears and we're going to write a book. Whose crazy idea was that? I don't hmm. know. I, I, it's, a, <laughs> it's a fog at this point. Um, yeah. But uh, the book, the topic that we chose is one I think that almost every organization that I know of uh, in, in Wells or in any other uh, faith based organization whether it be a church or school or other nonprofit, is project management. How do you um, how do you manage all those many many projects that you have over the course of a, a day, week, month, year, years, and uh, how do we how do you unstick stuck projects? Uh, that's that's really a challenge. Our our ministries are all about these little projects or big projects that we're trying to do, whether it's uh, running a school or uh, running a VBS or a kindergarten roundup or writing a building a, building. Building a worship service, um, <laughs> writing a sermon. All those are projects. Um, and there are some tools available that we're going to talk about in this book that hopefully will help. So to that end, we have created a little survey we would love for you to fill out that will uh, hopefully inform some of the direction the book goes and, and maybe some of the quotes even get in the book. And Sally, do we have a URL for that? We will have it in the show notes. It's not pretty, Martin, so it's not easy to share. So go <laughs> to, go to this week's show notes for episode 408 and look for, uh, we're calling it, it is kind of a working title. I think we'll change this eventually. Project Management for Churches and Schools. Um, but look for that link and really it's a short, short, short survey. It's a, uh, all we want is the answer to three simple questions. So it'll take you all of five minutes or less, uh, to, to fill out that information, hit submit and, uh, become a part of, uh, our effort to, to write this book, which, uh, I think we're going to have a lot of fun doing. So that'll be over the next seven or eight months. Uh, we figure a chapter a month and, um, Along the way, we're going to uh, we're going to invite you to come into the book and uh, read pieces of it, give feedback, participate in it. Kind of an interactive experience. We're going to build it together. So should be good. I'm looking forward to it, and hopefully, um, the work of God's kingdom will be blessed through it. That's our goal, of course. That's it. That's it. All with certainly a, uh, an eye toward stewardship and uh, using the gifts God has given us. So. So that's coming up next week. We ought to probably close up this week. We're running up against the, the hour here, two minutes short, according to my clock, Sally. Uh, These little short summer programs. Yeah, it kind of works that way once in a while. But good stuff. I really enjoyed it and uh, always enjoy our conversations. And I look forward to everybody coming back next week and joining us for episode 409. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll talk to you next week.